live. And I believe that we are officially uh, live. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome back to another seminar of our Sussex Vision Seminar Series, as always, within the Worldwide Neuro Initiative. I'm George Cafetzis, a master's graduate from Thomas Euler's lab. I'm currently a PhD student with Tom Baden. And as your host for today, I would like to once again begin by thanking Team Vocals and Panos Bozelos for putting forward this ever expanding initiative towards a greener and much more accessible seminar world. Having said that, allow me, of course, to get back to the reason we all gathered here for today and introduce our guest from the University of Manchester and the director of the Center for Biological Timing that is located there. Professor Robert Lucas. Following his uh, bachelor degree in biological sciences from the University of York, Rob worked with uh, Andrew Loudon at the Zoological Society of London for his PhD on circadian control of the neuroendocrine uh, axis. During his uh, postdoctoral years, he worked with uh, Russell Foster at Imperial with an ever increasing focus on circadian rhythms. And in 2000, he started as a lecturer at Imperial uh, before joining the University of Manchester in 2003, uh, where he has remained ever since, and nowadays holding the title of Professor of Neuroscience. For, uh, for a couple of decades now in his lab, uh, Rob has been exploring the general principles that govern the biological impact of uh, light, from uh, the retina and the at least traditionally believed as non-image forming light responses, uh, to an organismal level, and uh, namely how light regulates uh, mammalian behavior and physiology. Uh, furthermore, work of theirs includes the SI compliant characterization of uh, light's effective intensity and the study of uh, different options with both uh, research and clinical uh, perspectives. Uh, and having said that, I'm very happy to be leaving this stage for him for a talk entitled uh, Melanopsin Contributions to Vision in Mice and Man. So without any further ado uh, from my side, please all welcome Professor Lucas. Uh, Rob, the stage is officially uh, all yours. Thank you very much, George. Let me share my screen. You can tell me whether that's working. And then uh, let's do it. And now, yes, is that happening? Looking good? Yeah, and we can see your pointer, so we are good to go. Perfect. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks for that introduction, George, and, and for inviting me to give to, to present on this series. I, I'm really looking forward to it. I've been a, an attendee at a lot of these, so uh, it's, a, it's a great initiative. And congratulations on scheduling this between in the hour between World Cup matches. So that's great, too. Thanks very much. Um, so, uh, you know, as George said, we, we've been interested in, in melanops and, and kind of unconventional influences on visual and non-visual functions for a while. Um, and it's shockingly, what, nearly 25 years since we knew that the mammalian retina had photoreceptors other than rods and cones, and around about 20 years since we knew that that could be explained by these neurons here, shown in an on fast view of the mouse retina, intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells expressing the photopigment um, melanopsin. Uh, and the story I'm going to talk about today is something that we've been working on over the last, well, nearly decade, uh, trying to understand whether and how melanopsin might contribute directly to form vision. Um, and just a couple of, 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 kind of caveats at the beginning. Obviously, this is something that other people have been worked on, working on as well, but I, I don't have time to review that. So it's really going to be summarizing, uh, summarizing our own data on this, on this topic. But I think what I'm going to tell you, the take-homes are more or less consistent with what other people have found, um, found as well. Okay, so if you think about the function of melanopsin, one of the things to be aware of is that there aren't any simple answers, right? So if we ask what melanopsin is for, it was discovered, of course, in attempts to understand the mechanisms underlying uh, circadian photoentrainment, so how the circadian clock is set to local time by light. And pretty soon thereafter, additional kind of uh, endpoints for melanopsin were discovered in terms of, you know, regulation of the neuroendocrine axis and regulation of pupil size. And so there's an idea developing, first of all, that it might be a circadian photoreceptor, or if not a circadian photoreceptor, a non-image forming photoreceptor. And both of those kinds of terminology have some value. But there's an awkward truth here, which is that melanopsin knockout mice do just fine, right? So you can take melanopsin out of the system and they still have photoentrainment, they still have a pupil light reflex. Really, there's no visual function that they lack. So we can't designate melanopsin as responsible for any particular visual endpoint. And that makes sense if you think about 
how melanopsin sits within the overall structure of the visual system. So this is just a schematic of a retina, of a vertebral retina. Um, and where melanopsin lies, of course, is in a subset of these output neurons of the retina, the retinal ganglion cells. And those retinal ganglion cells then are capable of responding to light because they have melanopsin, some photopigment, but they're also responding to light because they have connections with the outer retina and therefore are downstream from signals coming from rods and cones. So at the very origin of the melanopsin light response, we have to think about it in relation to what's happening also from signals from rods and cones. Um, there's no separating it, right? It is, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a unity, right? So then the other, the other really interesting bit of, of melanopsin biology is that if you look at the IPRGC family, turns out there are multiple classes of IPRGCs and collectively they project to every retina, retina recipient region of the brain. So there's, on the one hand, melanopsin does nothing because melanopsin knockout mice do just fine. On the other hand, maybe it does everything because IPRGCs go to everywhere. And that highlights, I think, a really important principle to keep in mind here, which is that we need to ask not what melanopsin does, but how melanopsin fits into the picture of vision involving also rod and cone photoreceptors. And to get to that question, we need to start by considering what are the sensory capacities of melanopsin and how might that um, complement what rods and cones are capable of doing. Okay. So in terms of describing melanopsin's fundamental sensory properties, of course, we have a problem, which is that um, unlike rods and cones, where we could separate a rod or a cone photoreceptor and record its sensory, its, its light responses, IPRGCs sit there in the inner retina, where they're supposed to be getting input from the rods and cones all the time. So if you record an IPRGC light response, it's a composite of melanopsin and rod cone influences. So how can we separate the component of that response that comes from melanopsin. And the most straightforward way of doing it, and the way that's being used most widely, is to get rid of the rod and cone signal. So we can do that using retinal degenerate or transgenic animals, where we're silencing or getting rid of the rod and cone photoreceptors, or by applying pharmacological agents which deafferent the, the IPRGCs in different ways. I'm going to talk about for a little bit about the kind of uh, the outcome of those sorts of experiments in different contexts. All right, so the first thing if we do that, we can learn about um, the melanopsin sensory capacity. It's that it's maximally sensitive in the kind of scion portion of the, of the spectrum of the lambda max about 480 nanometers. So this is really, really useful information, but it doesn't really separate it with what rods and cones can do because that's right in the middle of the visible spectrum, okay. So one way in which it's different from rods and cones is if you look at rodless conus animals or rodless conus preparations, they're much less sensitive to light than an intact preparation. So the, the, the sort of threshold sensitivity of melanopsin is really pretty high. Um, and so if you look at the pupil rife, light reflex, um, you need about 15 lux of daylight to give the equivalent amount of photons for melanopsin to drive a pupil light reflex. So that gives you an idea of threshold. Um, and then if you look at a different responses, you can have a slightly different answer. So for the circadian clock, for example, it's much less light. So 0.5 lux of, of equivalent daylight would give you that effect. So a couple of things from that. Clearly, high, far above threshold for rods or cone photoreceptors, but equally far from ludicrous amounts of light. So most of us here, as we watch the seminar, will be having melanopsin activity. It's well within a kind of a, a, a dim light range. Okay. So the other one of the other cardinal features of it from rodless conus preparations is that the, the signal has very, very poor temporal resolution. And so this is data from David Burson's description of IPRGCs way back in 2002, and showing that in response to a light step here, it, at low light intensities, it takes a long time for the IPRGC to start being activity, active by its melanopsin signal, and then it decays a long time afterwards. And once you get higher light intensities, that on switch is faster, but you get an even slower decay thereafter. And we see that as well if you look in the brain. Um, so this is a work from anesthetized mice where we int introduce a, um, a multi-electrode probe into the dorsolateral geniculate in rodless conus animals, and you can find lots of light responses, 
But again, they have this characteristic of being slow to turn on and slow to turn off. So in terms of visual capacity, then that implies that there's kind of a space-time averaging element to the Melanopsin signal, which would introduce kind of visual blur for, a, uh, for, for, for visual images, for visual patterns. The other thing is that they have very poor contrast sensitivity. So in the rodless conus animal, we've tried quite a few times to look for light adapted um, uh, responses with reasonable visual contrast and pretty much failed. So it's very hard. This is data for a sinusoidal modulation, a very high amplitude sinusoidal modulation, a range of frequencies. And you can see there's almost, there's, there's really is no significant response from these rodless conus animals. Okay. So, the poor temporal resolution, poor contrast sensitivity is bad for many visual functions, but of course, for some things, it's totally fine. And one of the one of the one of the, the functions for which it would be pretty good is measuring that change in ambient light in background irradiance. Um, and in some ways, then, if you, you don't need very high contrast sensitivity, in fact, maybe it's good not to have high contrast sensitivity because you need to track a very wide range of light intensities uh, that might happen over dawn or dusk, for example. And similarly, sort of space-time averaging is quite useful for that because uh, you can get a more accurate estimate of, of light intensity. And it's interesting that if you look at the threshold for melanopsin responses, they sort of start at civil twilight, and it's carrying you all the way through then into that daylight range. So it's very good for that. Okay. So, um, but what I want to talk to you about is uh, melanopsin contrib contributions to vision. And of course, that ability to measure background light intensity can be important for the visual system as well. And I'm not gonna talk about this in detail, but I've already mentioned the pupil light reflex. And if you think about what melanopsin does for vision, set in pupil size is probably a really important first answer. But there's also growing evidence that melanopsin contributes to kind of a network light adaptation in the early visual system. So work from a number of labs around the world, not my own, have shown that IPRGCs make these centrifugal intraretinal connections to send, an, send a signal out to the rest of the retina. And again, work from, uh, from, from, from partly from my group, but also from others, showing that there's a melanopsin dependent adjustment in the visual code. And I don't have time to talk about the, the lovely work of, of my friends and colleagues in Manchester who've contributed to, to this over the years. So what do I want to talk about? Um, I'd like to talk about the work that we've done asking the question of well and whether melanopsin itself could make a direct contribution to form vision. So why is that a question worth pursuing, given what I've told you already? So... First of all, we know that circadian light responses in humans can survive even in the, in the absence of light perception. So we think that those responses come from melanopsin. This is work from Chuck Seisler's lab in, in the, in the mid-90s. Um, uh, but we don't know, but we think it comes from melanopsin. And yet these people have very, very rudimentary visual vision. So having melanopsin is not itself enough to have vision. On the other hand, there are a number of papers showing that visually guided behaviors can be recorded in animals that lack rod and cone function. That's either an advanced retinal degeneration or uh, the work of Ecker and colleagues in genetically silenced rods and cones. So we've done some work with the retinal degeneration uh, model in this. And I can tell you, getting them to show visually guided behavior is very, very hard. They're pretty close to blind. Uh, so. It, again, that fits in a way with the human phenotype that melanopsin on its own is very, very bad at supporting vision. Echo got much better, uh, got be much better outcomes with her preparation, interestingly. And that maybe highlights something that we need to keep in mind when we when we ask questions about melanopsin function based on rodless conus animals. And that is that this is a totally unphysiological preparation because melanopsin is always supposed to be working in the context of incoming signals from rods and cones. So as an example, it's perfectly tenable to think about melanopsin really as a neuromodulatory influence that's regulating those signals coming in from rods and cones rather than a source of independent visual information in itself. Um, and obviously if you get rid of rods and cones, then it's a totally different way that the system's working. So could melanopsin sensory capacity be different if we looked at it in the intact retina? 
And that's a challenge uh, uh, that, that we set out to look at some years ago. And the obvious problem we have is how do we separate the melanopsin signal from that coming from rods and cones in an intact retinal system without, first of all, kind of removing some of those inputs? And the strategy that we've taken is to take a concept that we borrowed from uh, uh, psychophysics, visual psychophysics and color science, that, and that's a receptor sign substitution. So many of you will know about this. I don't have time to go into in great detail, but just in broad principles, this is how it works. So imagine that you have two photoreceptors in your visual system, and they differ in their spectral sensitivity. So I've just plotted the, the spectral, um, spectral response profile for photoreceptor one and photoreceptor two. You can present a narrowband light source that will very actively stimulate both photoreceptor one and photoreceptor two. And you can also present a different stimulus that will very actively uh, excite photoreceptor two, but not photoreceptor one. And if you adjust the intensity and wavelength of those two lights, you can achieve a situation where they provide exactly the same excitation for photoreceptor two. But A is always going to be much more active, much brighter for photoreceptor one. And substituting light A for light B, therefore, is silent for photoreceptor two, but represents a big increase in effective brightness for photoreceptor one. And the outcome is that you record responses elicited by photoreceptor one. This is a very robust phenomenon. It's the basis of RGB architecture of visual displays, for example. And we can expand it to three or more photoreceptors by adding spectrally distinct light bands. You can use it to allow independent control of effective brightness for any target photoreceptor alone and in combination. So it's very powerful. The one limitation or one of the limitations is it works best when photoreceptors have divergent spectral sensitivity. And that's why all of the mouse data that I'm going to show you use this really, really powerful model that we got from Jeremy Nathan's lab, which is a, uh, an animal in which the human red cone opsin is expressed in place of the mouse medium wavelength sensitive cone. So it shifts their cones in sensitivity away from uh, melanopsin spectral sensitivity. The other really important thing here is that it's all about calibration. It's all about getting those A and B lights exactly the right wavelength and intensity comp. Um, combination. So I'm not going to bore you with the weeks and years and months of, of calibration that we've done with all these stimulus uh, stimuli. They're, they're in the published um, in, in the published papers, but we do a lot of it. <laughs> okay, so how does it work? So this is work from Tim Brown when he was in my lab. Um, Please say he's now a professor here at, at Manchester and, and a former speaker on this uh, Sussex Visions um, uh, seminar series. So uh, what Tim did um, was to produce a system where we only have three types of LEDs. We have a UV, a blue, and a green, and we can independently control their intensity. So this shows the spectral power distribution of two of those uh, lights of two settings, where we're regulating the amount of blue light here, so that when we're producing a lot of blue light, that has a big stimulus for melanopsin. And to make sure that it's not also a stimulus for cone, we adjust the red and the UV lights to, to, uh, to compensate for the effect on cones. So we can produce a stimulus which is only visible to melanopsin. And we can have a control condition where we get exactly the same melanopsin stimulus, but now we also allow cones to, to, to see an increase in light intensity by just having a spectrally neutral increase in light intensity. So what happens if you do that and you record from the mouse visual thalamus? And the answer is that your, uh, your, your responses fall into two different um, response categories, which we call melanopsin responsive or non-melanopsin responsive. And the melanopsin responsive units, when you present an all photoreceptor stimulus, have this sharp on excitation and then maintain firing when the light is present and then it decays afterwards. And when you do the melanopsin only signal, you get this quite different sort of response where you first of all don't see a response, and then it builds up slowly and dissipates slowly. Okay. Whereas the non-melanopsin responsive units don't respond to the melanopsin only stimulus and only respond transiently when the light goes uh, when the light goes on. And we get we get them at a ratio of about one to two. So about a third of the units are melanopsin responsive. And of course, we can check in melanopsin knockout mice whether that's um, uh, whether we. Uh, uh, whether to make sure that our stimuli work. And again, in melanopsin knockout mice, we don't get a melanopsin only response. 
So in the dorsal lateral geniculate nucleus of mice, sustained units are malnourished to responsive in visually intact animals. The malnopsin component of response is qualitatively distinct because it's sluggish and sustained. Okay. So having established that principle, we've gone on to use it quite a lot. And one of the things we wanted to do was to uh, develop a more sophisticated iteration of it. Um, we wanted to uh, add additional wavelength bands so that we can control rods as well to make sure that we weren't recording responses from rods at all. And then also allow us to present pattern stimuli. And Frank Marshall, who is an excellent workshop technician, uh, developed this thing based on a DMD projector system where we swapped out the light engine and now can control, uh, can present images uh, with five different wavelengths of, of light. And Annette Allen is one of the heroes of my presentation. She was involved in this work and lots of what I'm going to talk about now and is now a Henry Dale Fellow here in Manchester. So when you do this and you present a melanopsin only stimulus looks the same as when you do it just with a three LED uh, system. But what we can now go on to do is do more complicated things. And one of the things we wanted to do early on was to ask not what melanopsin only can do, but what happens if we provide a stimulus which is visible to rods and cones, but invisible to melanopsin. So because we have a different wavelength sensitivity to our cone photoreceptors, when we flip from, a, from, a, from, these, from, from two different uh, spectral compositions, they look different color to us, but for mice, they will look the same for melanopsin, but want to look brighter for rods and cones. And when you do that, you see, if you like, the flip of the melanopsin only response. So at early points in the light response, in that step response, the response is exactly the same. And the longer that the step is present, the more divergent those two, uh, the two conditions become. So firing is lower in the mel less condition. That requires quite high contrast for melanopsin. So just keep that in mind, we need rather big differences in melanopsin for in order for us to see that, that distinction. Um, Annette's gone on to look at the, at the, the, the frequency preference of that melanopsin signal by using this binary, uh, binary noise stimulus where we're introducing steps up between 15 and 0.1 Hertz and looking at a cross, uh, cross power spectral density analysis you can see that for our MR units, first of all, they like low frequencies very much, but in the mel less condition, they like them less. And by, con uh, by contrast, the non-MR units don't particularly like low frequencies, and there's no difference when we present the mel less condition. Okay. So melanopsin makes a unique contribution to DLGN activity, maintain response under extended presentation. So, now we want to use the, the, the pattern stimulus element of the, of the projector, and we can do that now by introducing uh, patterned images. So here we have a bar that's only visible to melanopsin, and we can use that to map spatial receptive fields. So when we did this, we were relatively agnostic. Given the time frames, it's totally possible that that melanopsin signal just appeared, appeared diffusely over all LGN neurons or a large fraction of LGN neurons and didn't really have any uh, 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 spatial uh, was not conveying any spatial information. But actually, it turns out that you can map spatial receptive fields very well from the melanopsin only stimulus. Uh, and uh, they match the size and location of receptive fields to a simple bar stimulus for that unit. So the, the, the spatial information, the spatial receptive field for melanopsin is exactly the same as it is for rod and cone photoreceptors for L LGN units. Then we can ask what happens with those bars not visible to melanopsin. And again, if we compare the responses, this is a representative unit for our all photoreceptors, where we get a nice, when the bar appears here, we get a nice on response, which is then retained as long as the bar is present. That's much less clear when you have the melanopsin less condition, where this sustained activity is much reduced. And that means that if you map receptive fields, uh, you get different answers depending on, well, you get different amplitudes depending on where you are in that 10 seconds of bar presentation. So at early points, the melanopsin less and the all photoreceptors response are superimposable. Whereas if you look at later time points, then the amplitude of that receptive field is much smaller in the mel less condition. So melanopsin enhances spatial information under extended presentation. Okay. So what our electrophysiology has told us so far is that 
it's met you can there are measurable melanopic spatial receptive fields so it's feasible that melanopsin might contribute to the representation of spatial images in the LGM. And indeed, it looks like melanopsin makes a distinct contribution to the visual response properties of, the, of neurons in the visual thalamus by enhancing response amplitude under extended view of higher contrast spatial patterns. So let's consider then why that might be useful for something more natural, an active, you know, a natural viewing situation. And for that, I think we need to keep two things in mind about, about vision in about natural vision. The first is that natural scenes show strong correlations in local radiance. And the second is that there's an inverse relationship between the frequency and magnitude of head and eye movements across all, uh, all species, at least that we've looked at, uh, from the literature, uh, including rodents. So what Annette did then was to look at a simulation of what that might mean from the perspective of the receptor field of an individual DLG un DLGN unit viewing any random scene. So this is a this is a scene, obviously, of, uh, of um, uh, sky and ground with bushes in between. And what she's done here is superimpose the receptive field um, uh, 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 over time, the multiple the multiple placements of that receptive field across the image, starting with a simulation where you've got small eye movements here or head or eye movements here, which move the receptive field around this part of the visual scene, and then you have a big change, and you have uh, now the receptive field falls in the sky, but again you have uh, more frequent lower amplitude uh, changes in the direction of view, which move the receptive field there. If you look then at what happens to the, 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 the radiance of light within that receptive field, what you find, of course, is that you've got um, through this phase here, when you're mostly located here, you've got lots of small amplitude changes in radiance. And then you get when you change your direction of view, you get a big change in radiance. And then it's then the, you have an epoch here where there are smaller changes. So maybe then what melanopsin might be doing is not really tracking these small events here, but tracking these, but helping keep track of what happens when you have these big changes here. In other words, the big patterns here between the ground and the sky in between um, eye movements. And that makes sense also when you think about the contrast sensitivity of melanopsin. Of course, the contrast, um, when you look at uh, 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 analyzing the receptive field over time, when you make big eye movements is much more biased towards high contrast than uh, when you look at the between shifts in gaze epoch. Okay, so that's how it could work. Do we have any evidence that it does work that way? And to get at that, what we did is ran a simple experiment uh, where again, we're recording from the LGN in mice and we envisage a scenario like this, right? So this is uh, our neighboring building here in Manchester, but you can see how it's got patterns throughout, but they differ across the scene in how bright the overall region is. So you have an area of high brightness, mid brightness and low brightness. So this is a very typical thing that might happen um, uh, in visual scenes. So what we can do then is present to our anesthetized mice the simulation of the eye moving to look at different parts of that scene by taking an image that has this characteristic and just changing its, its overall brightness. And we do that every one, five or 10 seconds. So to present a stimulus then that looks for the, uh, for the, for the photoreceptors like this. So all the time there are these high, these, these high spatial frequency elements and throughout the thing, throughout the recording, Annette's sh shifting these a little bit to simulate small eye movements. And then on top of that, she's putting these changes, these shifts and changes of, of direction of view, which are shown here, then which give you big changes in radiance. And in this case, because it's a spectrally neutral change, they're visible to all the photoreceptors. But of course, we can do that. We can change the spectrum rather than the brightness, and we can produce a vis version that's not visible to melanopsin. So in terms of rods and cones, they've got these changes in background, but melanopsin thinks it's exactly the same. Or conversely, have something that's visible only to melanopsin, but not visible to rods and cones. So the whole time there's this visual image and it's changing a little bit to simulate small line movements, and at the same time, we're changing it as if it was as if the eye was shifting to look at scenes that were differing in, in, in brightness. 
Okay, so what happens when you look at the melanopsin response of unit population uh, in, in response to this stimulus? Um, and if you look at the all photoreceptors um, uh, trace here, you can see that they're clearly responding to elements of the stimulus. And that's true also for the melanopsin less and for the melanopsin only. But I think you can immediately see that neither of these conditions do as well as the all photoreceptors. And so what Annette did was simply look at the correlation coefficient, coefficient between stimulus radiance or nominal radiance for the melanopsin less and melanopsin only condition and the firing rate of neurons. And if you look at the look at the melanopsin responsive units, you can see that that's much better for the all photoreceptors and pretty much equal for the melanopsin less and melanopsin only. So melanopsin is required to have this good tracking of that stimulus. Uh, and even without rods and cones, you can still get reasonable tracking. Conversely, if you look at the non melanopsin responsive units, first of all, they don't track these large sustained changes in, in, in radiance very well. And uh, so you can compare this to this, but also there's no effect of melanopsin. Okay. So we're going to leave the mouse electrophysiology here, but just to summarize what I've told you, melanopsin compensates for relaxation of rod cone signals, allowing a better representation of spatial patterns in brightness in the mouse DLGN within a reasonable framework for pattern vision. So what might we predict then if we wanted to move to recording visually evoked behaviors and to try and work out how melanopsin might contribute to visual behaviors? We, contribute, we, we, we expect that melanopsin could contribute to discriminating core spatial patterns and during periods of visual fixation. And so those are the predictions that we want to, to try and test by doing some um, assessments of, 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 of vision. So how could we do that? Um, so it is possible to, re to record a melanopsin contribution to vision in visually intact mice. Um, and we did this back in 2012, based on this paradigm, where we had mice in a swim maze and trained them to sw swim towards a brighter, so it's just a trapezoid swim maze. There's a false choice here where they can swim to get to the escape platform. And we trained them to swim towards a bright window, uh, a brighter window to find that escape platform. So that's the training epoch. And then what we can do is change the, the wavelength of those two lights. So our, in, a, in our probe sessions, one lane is always red. Uh, so that's going to be very bright for cones and moderately bright for melanopsin. And then we present as the, as the alternative choice, a green panel where we can alter its intensity. So the bias for melanopsin is always to find green brighter than red. So we'd expect, if melanopsin is relevant, we'd expect them to have a bias towards swimming towards the green panel. Right. And if we then plot the percentage at which the mice uh, choose the green cha channel as a function of the brightness of that green panel, no surprises that if the green panel is very bright, then they reliably swim there. And if the green panel is very dim, then they reliably swim towards the red. What's interesting is the point at which they judge those two panels to be equally bright is different in our red cone knock in mice compared to red cone knock-in mice that lack the melanopsin gene. So that loss of melanopsin gene is changing the spectral sensitivity of their preference, of their judgment of brightness, which is which we think is pretty uh, good evidence that, um, the, the, that melanopsin is helping those mice to judge brightness in this paradigm. So it is possible then to, to, to find visual responses in mice that have a melanopsin signature, it is also very, very hard work. It's hard work knowing how, uh, asking a, man, a mouse what it could see. Um, and we were lucky uh, early on to establish a collaboration with Seichi Sujimura, who's a psychophysicist, who was doing similar work in humans. And so what Seichi has done here is generated as kind of a spot stimulus to spot, yeah, large spot stimulus. And he's asking people to, to, to judge relative brightness against a reference uh, and a test stimulus, and the test stimulus, he can either add in melanopsin effective brightness or not. And what he finds is that the point at, the, the point at which um, uh, people judge those two stimuli as being equally bright, 
So that's that 50% point here is, uh, is dependent on how much melanopsin content uh, the, the, the reference stimulus has. So um, uh, evidence that in humans, uh, they judge large field light fields with higher melanopsin stimulation is brighter. And this is something that's been reproduced now in many other in many other labs. Um, and proper psychophysicists are looking at this have, and have looked at the relationship with luminance um, and uh, and exactly how it might fit into models of of brightness perception. Um, but what we wanted to do in view of what we had from the, the mouse data that was coming through uh, was to move towards being able to present spatially structured stimuli to human subjects to look at how melanopsin might contribute to spatially structured uh, vision. Um, and generating a version of our melanopsin projector system for humans is difficult. Um, and the strategy has to be slightly different for various reasons. But what we've done uh, is, is again start with, um, with these uh, data projectors, these, these um, projector systems. Um, but in this case, uh, we've taken two projectors and we superimpose their image and we filter the RGB channels of each of them so that instead of now having two images, each of which have three channels RGB, we now have two projectors, each of which have three channels, but of different wavelengths. And so we can end up with a system like this, where we've got a band here in the deep blue, something at cyan, something at green, something at yellow, something at red. And that gives us the degrees of freedom then to modulate in selectively uh, the melanopsin brightness of any pixel within that image. Okay, so here are two spectral power densities that are melanopsin high and melanopsin low and they appear identical in terms of hue, saturation, and luminance, that's because they're identical for cone photoreceptors. And again, this is to remind me that lots and lots and lots of calibration to make sure that this works, particularly in humans, not only between individuals, but also between parts of the retina. It's very important that you keep that in mind. Okay, so one of the first things we, we, we'd like to do with that is just to present some melanopsin images and see what we see, right? Um, and the answer is it's pretty weird. Um, there's definitely something there. Uh, so this is a kind of a documentation, a documentary uh, description of, of, of our sort of subjective experience. So uh, what we've done here is present two versions of a standard image here. And in all cases, we ask people to fixate here and we, we fill out this kind of central region of the, of the image. Happy to explain why the questions. Um, and then image one, um, uh, uh, doesn't is doesn't is not just has the sort of standard uh, melanopic contrast between elements of the image, and image two is augmented for melanopsin contrast. So the bright bits of the image look really bright for melanopsin, and the dim looks dim bits look then very dim. But for cones, they're exactly identical. So photometrically, these are identical images. And when you present them to people, this is like free-form descriptions of, 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 of what people say. Um, and it's a sort of a sense of them being brighter, but more distinct, more sort of stand out. And then if you ask people to rate which of those uh, versions is more distinct, uh, they reliably, um, uh, reliably report that the high melanopic uh, Im image is more distinct. So consistent with our view then that there's something about patterns with this, it, with this, um, with this, with this stimulus that uh, melanopsin is revealing. Okay, um, I think I'm going to whiz through this just to say that one of the other things you can do with this melanopic stimulus is you can ask whether um, whether it regulates uh, sort of circadian and non um, uh, non visual functions as well. And so we worked with Christian Kajochen at, at the University of Basel. Um, and had people going into his lab in the evenings just watching movies, either in melanopsin low or melanopsin high condition. And as over the course of the evening, people tend to become more sleepy, but they became less sleepy when the image, when the movie was rendered in melanopsin high. So augmenting melanopsin was keeping them more awake, and also it was tending to suppress their, their melatonin production. So this, this, the device can show that the control of melanopsin can be used to adjust the impact of long-term light exposure on sleep alertness and melatonin suppression. But let's return to our question of, uh, of form vision, pattern vision. Um, and what Annette went to go on to do next was to present more kind of um, 
um, uh, calibrated stimuli uh, to ask what sort of thing that humans might be able to see if rendered in melanopsin. So for these first experiment, what she's done is again had a fixation point here, and then somewhere in the periphery, we put this grating, uh, and that grating can exist in one of four directions, four orientations, and we asked the subjects to uh, to tell us uh, what orientation that grating was. Okay, this grating is visible only for melanopsin. So as far as the cones are concerned, this is this this is just a continuation of the background field here. So it's a melanopsin only stimulus. And when you do that, and you ask people whether they can see it. Uh, people get significantly better than chance at, at judging the angle here of this grating. On the other hand, you can see here that at no point are they getting it 100% correct. So it's not easy to see these things. So it's more of a feeling that there's something there. Okay. So the next thing we can do is we can change the grating frequency and ask what happens to their ability to see that. And when you do that, you can see that really we need pretty fat bars, pretty thick gratings in order for people to be able to resolve that melanopsin only uh, stimulus. So it's only when we have very low spatial frequencies that we can see that stimulus. As a control, we can do exactly the same thing for an all photoreceptor stimulus, and that has a much more familiar um, a spatial frequency preference where you get optimal performance here about one or two cycles per degree. So one last thing we can do here, or one of the other things we can do here, is, is adjust the contrast, the melanopic contrast of this grating. So not just have it at maximum contrast, but start to try to rate it down. And what you see is that you need relatively high contrast stimuli in order for this to be visible. Whereas in the, in the orange here, for an all photoreceptor stimulus, I mean, basically, there's, we run out of resolution for our projector. Any, any all photoreceptor stimulus uh, at the lowest contrast we can present is visible to the subject. So it's much less contrast sensitive than the rod and cone system. And that, if you remember, makes sense, right? Because if we looked at our simulations of, of natural view of, a, of, of visual scenes, we're expecting, first of all, that melanopsin is going to be doing, going to be particularly useful for low spatial frequency patterns, and also that it can be biased towards higher contrasts. Sorry, lower contrasts. Okay, so melanopsin only patterns are discernible at low spatial frequency and high contrast. So the last work we've done on this um, uh, is a work from Tom Boulders in the lab. So uh, Tom's been working on this Troxler fading paradigm, um, which relates to the question of how uh, of how melanopsin works under extended view. So some of you will be already familiar, I'm sure, with this uh, with this visual illusion. So what we need to do here is focus, is stare at this man in the boat, but keep attending to the sun here. And this is a this is a, a, a painting from Claude Monet, uh, and this is a phenomenon that was first described, actually, or first documented by Erasmus Darwin. Um, and uh, and what it is is you should start seeing that the sun start fading away, so you stop seeing it. And this is the this is the troxel fading, so the fading of elements of the scene which are under under steady view. So. If we think about what we asked, what we thought melanopsin might do based on the electrophysiology, um, this is the type of visual illusion where we might start seeing a melanopsin contribution, right? We might we might think that having more melanopsin would delay that troxel fading event. Um, and so uh, Tom's looked at that um, by presenting a stimulus such as this. So again, we have a fixation point here. And this time in the periphery, we get this kind of fuzzy blob appearing on this, on, in the periphery. Yeah, and it's a bright blob. And we just ask people to fixate on that and tell us when, uh, when, that's, when that blob disappears. And the answer is that the rate at which that blob disappears is dependent on how bright the spot is, right? So if you increase the contrast, the luminance contrast on the spot, it takes longer for the spot to disappear. Now we can introduce the melanopsin dimension and take a spot which has the same luminance contrast, but introduce melanopsin contrast. And we find reliably that the spot takes longer to disappear. 
there's quite a lot of inter-individual variation. So in some ways, it's easier to see it as a Z-score. And you can see here that uh, for each individual, there's quite a substantial difference in the duration that that spot lasts if it has a melanopsin component. So it works for bright spots. It also works for dark spots. So this is the converse stimulus where we're asking people to tell us when this dim spot disappears. And again, that depends on the contrast between the background and the dark spot. And adding melanopsin contrast to that has the expected effect. So again, it takes longer for the spot to disappear if we have a melanopsin contrast component. Okay. So introducing melanopsin contrast slows image fade. So that's really what I wanted to tell you. Um, and to put it together in terms of like linking, I think what we see in terms of the mouse electrophysiology and the human visual uh, visual test, um, visual experiments, um, I think we can type, think about um, uh, a visual scene such as this as having patterns over multiple spatial scales, right? So from the very fine detail here, to, uh, to, to, to ultimately to just the overall amount of light in the environment with everything in between. And what we find is that once the, the further you move into the low spatial temporal frequency range, the more that it looks like melanopsin is important. Um, and that melanopsin does seem to make a, um, a, a distinct and uh, uncompensatable contribution to the, to, the, to, the, to the representation of these lower spatial frequency um, uh, elements of the image. So you can almost think about it as melanopsin allowing cones to focus on the very high frequency elements here by taking care of the lower frequency components and allowing us to have visual fixation by um, by allowing us to, to 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 by keeping track of the coarse patterns while we're fixating on small elements here. Okay, so what else is interesting to do here? I mean, there's so many things, but just a couple of things that that, that I think are really really cool to be thinking about. One of which is I think that we still need to test the limits of this model with different in different scenarios. Um, looking at different species, for example, but also in different types of view. So I think that's really important. The other thing I think to keep in mind here is that we're really asking melanopsin to do a lot of heavy lifting, right? Because if we talk about temporal scales, we think that melanopsin is important in telling the difference between day and night. So that's a really long time frame, maybe even times of year, a really, really long time frame. At the same time, it's it's also contributing to those differences in brightness that occur within the within the time frame of, of shifts in visual um, uh, in gaze, in, in, in gaze across the visual field, which is much shorter. It's also asking it to cover a massive differences in, in, in brightness between day and night time or across that dust to daytime transition, and also the much smaller things that happen within a scene. So it's really, it's, 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 it's doing a lot. And it'd be really nice to start relating that to the cell physiology and, and, and emerging evidence of signaling complexity um, for melanopsin. So this is a, a summary of, of, um, of what we know about the IPRGC population from Contreras et al. in their, their recent review. Um, and the upshot is that, at least in mice, there's, there's probably six types of melanopsin retinal ganglion cell, and they have distinct projections and distinct phy physiology. Um, really nice to start relating that more directly into their, re their role to covering this range, the spatiotemporal range of, of vision to which melanopsin might contribute. We also uh, have surprising complexity in the signaling of, of melanopsin within the cell. So melanopsin is a G-protein coupled receptor, right? Light activated GPCR like rod and cone opsins. And it was thought for a long time that it was activating a G-alpha Q signaling cascade, much as happens in invertebrate photoreceptors. Um, and that certainly is the case. Um, but, uh, but we've shown in cell culture that melanopsin can also very efficiently activate G-alpha-I and G-alpha-S. And we know from the work from Tiffany Schmidt's group and from King Yao's group that actually you can get melanopsin signaling without G-alpha-Q pathways. So it'd be really interesting to think about how this signaling complexity also allows, fits into this question of how melanopsin can cover this big spatial temporal range. 
Returning to mod Melanops and modulatory influence on vision, I think is also a really nice thing. So how is the visual code changing according to that Melanops and signal? And finally, be nice to see this applied in the in the real world. So um, just disclosure of interest, we do we have, have some patterns about designing melanops and displays, but leaving that aside, um, all of our visual displays and image capture uh, architecture at the moment assumes that everything about vision can be uh, encompassed in our three cone photoreceptor system. That's why we have RGB displays. Um, if you're building a new type of visual display architecture, it seems crazy not to also include melanopsin. Right. So I'll finish with acknowledgements. We've been very lucky to get funding from the ERC, the Wellcome Trust, and the BBSRC. I've mentioned some of the contributions from people in my group in Manchester while I've been speaking, but it's really a massive team effort. And, uh, and these people, all of these people have made big contributions, as have our collaborators around the world. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Rob, for this very interesting uh, talk and uh, your attempts to elucidate what is the contribution of melanopsin in vision uh, in uh, natural retina impact wise when it comes to the input and naturalistic settings with what you uh, try to take it like uh, experimental wise. Uh, there are already some questions appearing in the in the chat and I would like to remind to our audience that they can either uh, post their question there and I will moderate and communicate it to Rob, or you can join us in the Zoom room that we are currently using, and I will be posting uh, the link right now in the chat, uh, because in five to 10 minutes, depending on the question, I will be terminating the broadcast and we will continue uh, offline. So the first question is from uh, Gregor Belusic. Uh, Hi, great work. Maybe I've missed it, but how can you distinguish between human melanopsin vision and the possible effect of rod vision? Do you assume rods are saturated at the used light levels? Yeah, so that's a really good that's a really good point. Um, so in this, uh, um, whereas in the mouse, for our electrophysiology, we have enough um, uh, enough capacity to have stimuli which are also rod silent. For the human for the human work, we have um, we also we we've, we're working at a at a light level where we we hope the rods are approaching saturation, and we realize that this is imperfect. Um, at least for the for the for the for the visual display um, work that we've done, you can of course have stimuli which would also be rod silent, but then you have very little cone contrast. So, uh, sorry, melanopsin contrast. So it's almost like we we put it together as the way that we think about it. I suppose is that the work from the mouse poses hypotheses, and those hypotheses we can then we can then test for the human experiments. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it can, it, it's, it's, it's a sort of a, a conceptual justification that, that rods will make little contribution rather than a direct, uh, a, a direct demonstration of that. So that's totally a fair question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other question is from Wei Li. Is M4 the main conduit for melanopsis contribution to form vision? So I think that's a great question, right? And I think that, you know, I think what's really important is that to keep in mind is that what we're doing is looking at a systems level. So we're, for us, we're totally agnostic about where this comes from in terms of the, uh, in terms of the, um, in terms of the, um, in terms of the, 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 the melanopsin response. Um, what we can say is that, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing a melanopsin contribution in the mouse LGN to maybe a third of the LGN units. And obviously the M4 IPRGCs are a much smaller fraction of the, um, of the, of the total ganglion cell population. So at some level, um, we need to explain that discrepancy, right? And we don't have an explanation for that yet. So does that mean that those M4 cells have lots of projections that 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 um, that that's a massive expansion, or that maybe some of the other IPRGC types are contributing, and how that whole thing fits together. Uh, in terms of the 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 the, the phenomena that we've described, we don't yet have a clear link to an individual uh, IPRGC type. I mean, in terms of projections to the to the LGN, it's not only the M4s that go there, so it's definitely possible that other melanopsin classes could contribute. And before I move on with uh, the cross species questions and uh, what expectations do they generate, like your findings generate uh, or justify, like for different diets, uh, some questions that I have, like the first, please apologize, my ignorance, but when it comes to primate vision and retina, do we know anything about the density of IPR disease with increased eccentricity? Yes. Do so you expect 
Yeah, so there's there's there's, there's really nice work done um, by uh, by several groups, um, and the from memory the, the upshot is that the 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 outside the actual fovea itself, the 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 fraction of melanopsin positive retinal ganglion cells uh, it sort of remains relatively constant. So that means that there are many more melanopsin retinal ganglion cells in the kind of perifovial region, and then mm-hmm. left as you move outside. Um, but there's but but that reflects the overall number of ganglion cells in those different parts of the retina. And the other question I had, like stimulus wise, because you present this grating that is invisible to rods and cones, but melanopsin cells can see it. Is it possible to like slightly move this grating, like to introduce a temporal aspect to this stimulus without the rods and cones seeing it, or this is impossible? Sure, no, no, definitely, absolutely, yeah, it's possible to do that. Yeah, you can do that. Um, yeah, you can do Have that. Have you tried it to see how the responses of the melanopsin cells might change? Um, so let me think. So you're looking for a temporal modulation. I mean, obviously, with the with the with the receptive field mapping stimulus, uh, you know, this is a this is the bar moving in space over time along the azimuth. So that sort of does that. Does that answer your question, or are you looking for something? It could be. I'm just interested because, like, I mean, and these are questions that I will try to ask you later. But like, because yeah. it looks like the melanopsin cells have like very long latencies compared yes. to what you would expect from rod and cone input. I was wondering what uh, temporal frequency they can encode right. uh, when right. they are the only ones seeking. Yeah, so that would be, I guess, the the, the the way that we approached that was with the that um that binary that binary modulation stimulus where we we varied the frequency of that. And it looked like and from that we we, we estimate that frequencies like less than one hertz is when you start seeing a melanopsin melanopsin contribution. But I think actually there's more to do with that because that's not the same thing as a kind of a sinusoidal modulation for example right. modulation and that's uh that's something that we're kind of working on at the moment so i can't give you an answer to that great thank you very much uh, and like now i will proceed with the questions uh, that uh, tom posted and if there are no more questions uh, appearing from the audience uh, after this two and the um answers from you i will terminate the live broadcast uh, as uh, we will continue offline and some people are already here. So the first question that uh, Tom asks is, so in that view, doesn't this imply that melanopsin should be relatively more important the smaller the eye and as the worse the special resolution? What about animals with uh, tiny eyes? Um, right. Well, um, so there's a whole visual ecology question built in here as well isn't there in terms of what it what's important about 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 vision and the reason that i say that is the the extent to which we've looked at cross species with this in terms of electrophysiology um is uh we've been working with uh, rhabdomus which is a diurnal rodent which has a cone rich retina really massively expanded visual system um and for them uh, melanopsin seems to first blush, much less important for vision, uh, and that's probably because they are they're, they're performing different types of visual tasks to to the to to to, to a lab mouse. So I think that would probably make a would probably be the bigger determinant of how important melanopsin is. Um, but uh, and then so it's to do with how probably to do as much to do in the in terms of the spatial domain, the temporal domain, right? How much having that image stabilization vision is important for them, I would guess. Um, so, but mm-hmm. really, really interesting things about how it varies. You know, that's one of the things I wanted to get across with this, like probing this hypothesis with different species, I think is really, is really a cool thing. And the other question of his, uh, which takes uh, into, like takes it into more evolutionary context. So uh, many non-mammals have had melanopsin in earlier retinal neurons, including before the on-off split. Would one therefore expect off melanopsin signals and what would they mean? Um, I mean, in principle, uh, well, blimey, that's a, that's a, first of all, that's a very difficult question because it's pure speculation, right? Um, but I think, uh, you know, if you look at melanopsin outside mammals and you go into, into non-mammalian vertebrates, first of all, it fits in a picture of lots of different types of, of opsins, right? Not just melanopsin, not just one type of melanopsins, multiple types of melanopsins when you get into fish. 
I don't need to tell you guys. And then pinopsins and parapinopsins and VAopsins. And like, so pick the bones out of that because presumably they're all doing something slightly different in terms of the, the sensory capacity of the fish. Um, I would imagine given that, you know, why does, what is it about melanopsin that means that it that imposes a relatively low sensitivity? So it's pigment density is much lower than rods and cones. So they're all gonna have relatively low sensitivity and or low spatial temporal resolution. Um, so you think that melanopsin is gonna be doing that wherever it is. And if that's in off bipolar cells, it's doing that for off bipolar cells, you know? So like, it's an unsatisfactory answer, isn't it? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, we will see Tom is here, so yeah. hopefully he will uh, elaborate yeah. and continue down that road uh, soon. So the last question that I have before we terminate uh, the broadcast and continue offline is, if I remember correctly from my retina lecture, so the melanopsin is a bistable option, right? So mm -hmm. it can... Okay. And Let's this only helps... Mm -hmm. Anyway, okay. fine, this, carry on. Mm -hmm. This helps with uh, evading saturation, I guess, but it doesn't help with the latency, right? So the latency is uh, dependent on the later biochemical pathway. Yeah. So mm -hmm. The fact that we have like this maintained response over extended stimulus presentation, could it be just that the melanopsin signaling kicks in later? So this is why it gives the impression of um I'll say ma like maintained in that sense. Yeah. So Michael Doe, of course, and Harvard has done lots of really interesting work on this. Uh so I I'll just try and channel that and and, and I hope I don't root, uh, mess it up. But the I think the um the maintained activity then is to do with, um, well, we know that melanopsin um, can be switched on and off with light. The rate at mm -hmm. which that happens at the light intensities we're talking about, I would argue is relatively small because there's another thing that definitely happens, which is melanopsin has a dark regeneration. So that's definitely happening. Okay. And it also has a biochemical signal termination. So Phyllis Robinson has shown very nicely that you get phosphorylation of the melanopsin C terminus, and that's important for switching it off. So I think it, it, this ability, this this bistability, tristability is a really important phenomenon and feature of melanopsin. It, but probably the things that we're talking about, it's you can think about it much more like a conventional photoreceptor. That the rate at which it switches on and switches off is to do with the buildup of the second messenger systems and the rate at which the the the, the 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 signaling cascade switches turns off and turns down again scales up and down i see thank you very much uh, rob and uh, thank you in general for giving this uh, this talk uh, and at this point i will uh, stop the live broadcast so we can continue uh, offline with people that are interested thank you very much my pleasure and we are officially